We are going to be continuing our study, our systematic theology study, and tonight we're going <laughs> to... <laughs> we're not even going to scratch the surface of God's sovereignty. But I think our launching scripture tonight, I think, I know, our launching scripture is going to be from Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah 45, starting in verse 7. I am the Lord, and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all of these. Drip down, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds pour down righteousness. Let the earth Open up and salvation bear fruit and righteousness spring up with it. I, the Lord, have created it. <laughs> Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker. An earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, he has no hands. Woe to him who says to the father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, to what are you giving birth? <clears throat> Lord, um, as we study tonight, we pray that you would reveal yourself to us, your sovereignty. Lord, we know that we're not in control and you are. So reveal yourself tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Here is one of those subjects that even after this study, even after going through everything tonight that we go through at the very end, um, every one of you, I'm sure, is going to be going, hey, John, you totally missed, and then you fill in the blank, because when we study God's sovereignty, man, it is a huge, huge study, so we won't cover it exhaustively whatsoever tonight but defining the term <coughs> excuse me defining the term when we say god is sovereign in general we mean that he is powerful all powerful authoritative in control and over all things god's sovereignty is the concept that god possesses all or ultimate power and is the ruler of all things. God rules and works according to his eternal purpose, even through events that don't seem um, or that don't seem like they align with his purpose or events that would appear to us that would contradict his purpose. So Jonathan Edwards <clears throat> this thing going on that always helps <clears throat> Jonathan Edwards says the sovereignty of God is his absolute independent right of disposing of all creatures according to his own pleasure so God has the right the absolute right to govern his creation as he pleases. He has perfect knowledge and perfect power with which he controls everything. And we see that throughout scripture. Psalm 103, 19, <clears throat> the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. 
Scripture, when we go through the totality of Scripture, it emphasizes God's sovereign rule. And it, in the majority of it, when we look at it, we can split that up and see that God's sovereignty or his sovereign rule is, is mainly brought to life through his crease in his creation. We see it in human history and we see it in his redemption. Those are the three main categories that basically cover everything in about God's sovereignty. And obviously we're not going to be able to cover all of that tonight. That would be absurd, but God <coughs> is King and Lord over everything. Everything, like we just said, in his creation, in history, and redemption, and probably a whole lot of other stuff that that we don't even know about because we're stuck on this little blue and green globe, okay? So, to put it simply, we, we will we'll say that God's sovereignty, nothing happens without God's willing it to happen or willingness to allow it to happen. Job, after he went through all of the things that he went through at the very end, when he confessed to the Lord, he said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. There it is. The sovereign attributes of God are seen throughout Scripture and even more so throughout all of his characteristics, his omniscience, and his knowledge over everything that happens, right? Helps to put God in a position to be, obviously, with all knowledge. I know everything, therefore I can be in control of everything. So everything is not interchangeable, but it's linked and tied with everything. And that's the same thing that happens with his sovereignty is it links and ties with all of his other characteristics. Matthew 10. Okay, making sure it's changing. I need to angle that mirror so that I can make watch it this way it says are not two sparrows sold for a cent and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father but the very hairs of your head are all numbered sometimes he only has to get to three but they're still all numbered so do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. It was funny because last Sunday, since excuse me, we were all uh, quarantined or just staying home, letting all that time span, Deb and I were watching a message, and one of the big parts of the message was uh, this, this pastor has a window in his office that overlooks a park. And he saw that, you know, there's... there's thousands and thousands and thousands of sparrows and all of these sparrows every once in a while they would you know think hey there's another room over there and fly head headlong into the <laughs> boom no more sparrow but it was neat because he made the the point that god knows every time one of those happens every time one of those little sparrows breaks its neck on the window God knows. And he says in through his travels, he went to Israel and realized, wow, all the sparrows over in Israel, they look just like the sparrows in California. And God knows about those sparrows. And then he knows about the sparrows in naming all the other places that he went to. You know, God knows that is, that's his total knowledge. That is his total control because none of that happens without him knowing. Not even the sparrows falling to the ground are apart from your father, it says. So, I love when, uh, when uh, God talks. 
Do you want to turn that on? There we go. When God talks with men and men try to negotiate or think that they know better, Lord, you're almost right in this situation, but hey, what about what about this, right? They think men think that, okay, I have a better plan. Let's do it my way, looking at the Lord. But really, in reality, it's not that they have a think that they have a better plan, but what they're really doing is they're they're questioning God's sovereignty. God has a perfect plan. And we as believers, even the non-believers, we all fall in line somewhere with that perfect plan. So anytime we raise our hand and go, okay, Lord, I don't think you got it right on this one. Let's, let's, what we're in a sense we're doing is we're questioning God's sovereignty, right? Isaiah 45, six through nine, the Lord says, I am the Lord and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness. This was our launching verse, right? Causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all of these. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker, right? An earthen vessel among the vessels of earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? You, you didn't give me a handle, right? Or, hey, you made, you made my, you know, bottom, my foundation too small. I'm going to fall over. No, no, the clay doesn't say to the potter any of that. He just, we used the, I used the term last week, squishy, right? We have to be squishy in, in the, the hands, pliable in the hands of the potter. We have to trust God and his perfect control and his perfect will to question or advise God. Hey, Lord, I think you should have done it this way. Or I think you should have, you know, given me a handle or given me a pour spout or what is that teacup, you know, okay. It means that we're trying to control the sovereignty of God, right? We have ideas all the time, but we know that our ideas are not even remotely close to his. His ways are higher than ours. And, and most of the time we don't get it. So. Moving on, we see um, sovereignty. We see the same sovereignty of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, and obviously Jesus is God, but in his conception down here, in his, his um, incarnation, the same sovereignty that God holds throughout all of the Old Testament, we see in Jesus. In Colossians 1 16 it says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. That's this is talking about Jesus. So Jesus in God in flesh still maintain, maintains the ultimate sovereignty that we saw of Yahweh or Jehovah in the Old Testament. Jesus, in his own words, stated that he was only committed, he was committed totally to do the mind and the purpose of God's perfect will. In John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Uh, Jesus is basically saying, look it, there's a plan already set in place. God, I, set this plan in place, and I'm sticking to it. I'm, I'm not going to waver. I'm not going to do this. There's, there's something in motion, and I'm moving forward to it. So we all get the concept of really um, God carried out through Jesus, the sovereignty of God. When we start diving in deeper to the sovereignty of God, we see that there are there are people that see God's sovereignty differently. Okay? <laughs> the, 
the sovereignty of God is really can be divided up into um, into two camps. Excuse me, two different camps. Kind of like a chess game. We have the two different sides. One side, okay, and I'm, I'll I'll talk about the way over on the one side and then way over on the other side. One side says that God's sovereign control planned every detail in that he even planned, which is God's desire, my plan, that's his desire, that sin would enter the world and that his sovereign plan has all these utterly, completely controlled players in it. Robots, if you will. Okay, so the fringe on the side believes that God specifically created some people to go to heaven, obviously, but specifically created, okay, I'm making you because I need to fuel the flames of hell. I need somebody to go to hell. Okay, so that is, that is the fringe on one side. When we look at the fringe on the other side, the other camp goes so far to the opposite side that so far to the extreme that they take the concept of free will so far that they remove God's sovereignty altogether because everything is based on, well, you have a choice. You have, it. and then all of a sudden they put the hand, they put in the hands of a sinner, all of the, the weight and glory of their own salvation, Right. So free will and salvation lies completely in the control of a person, an individual. And that removes the concept of God's sovereignty completely out of the Bible. So, in my opinion, when we're kind of going through this, I see both sides are very, very right in some of their aspects. And both sides are very, very right wrong if you would in their views i can't fully resolve completely and utterly on one side and i can't fully resolve completely and utterly and maybe that's just me not being able to study this in the totality of what god has planned but on one hand god doesn't create make or force people to sin Okay? He doesn't force someone to sin. So I, I can't totally justify him and these little robots or anything like that. But on the other side, right, you can't remove God's sovereignty. Um, Romans 8 says, We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to to his purpose. So we understand God doesn't force us to sin. We sin. Oh, it got stuck. Wait. There we go. Yep. We sin because we're sinful. We sin because of the fall because we're trapped in these sinful bodies, because we're not perfect, we're far from it. Yet, for the purpose of God's plan, sin is allowed, because in some divine way, it will eventually bring about the perfect end, the perfect result, okay? And that's where, that's where this comes in. God is going to work together all of those things. So then you have that on the one side, and then you have on the other side, we can't remove the total fact of sovereignty because our salvation is not controlled by us whatsoever. <laughs> we don't control our salvation. It's not our own ability. It starts with God and, and ends with God right? It's in God's control. John 6, says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. 
and I will raise him on the last day. So you have both you have both of these sides that they both some places they make super awesome points, some places I feel like they miss it some same thing over here, right? So then you have to come up where's where's the balance? Where's the balance? I say the balance is in God's word. So the question is how can God be in complete and absolute control and still allow free will to exist because he does and he is so the answer to that is you guys are sensible people i stole that from alistair Begg. you guys are sensible sensible people study that one for yourself when we come up to that we can this will have some great conversations at the end here because i know there's you know there is different camps and different ideas and there are things that are right about both sides so there has to be a balance so moving on both sides can agree on this god's sovereignty his perfect will will be accomplished both sides 100% can agree that his perfect will the end result it will be accomplished no one can stop god daniel 4 35 says all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? God is in control. How he does it, I don't know, right? There are mysteries that he withholds from us, you know, but we can both agree, both sides can agree that his perfect will will be accomplished. Both sides can agree that God's sovereignty is ultimate power. Psalm 135, 5 and 6 says, For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deeps, all the depths. Okay? We can agree both sides God is all powerful we try and try and try to figure it out and and put a label on it and adjust it this way to this doctrine and adjust it this way to that doctrine but we we have to fall back on what do we know for sure his will will be accomplished and the way that that's accomplished is because he is all knowing and all powerful so the exhaustive and definitive explanations as to how god utilizes all of this for his glory and for his purpose i think right and you always have to be careful when you're behind one of these things and in front of a microphone and you have people out there when you say the word i think <laughs> you have to be very careful with that but I'm going to say, I think that we will all find out after he explains it to us in heaven. <laughs> so, so there's a safe bet. I think we can agree. Here we go. I said it again. I think we can agree on this. First Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, O Lord. Let me, let me say that again. Yours, O Lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in heaven and, and the earth. Yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Both sides have to agree on that. So, really, staying away from landing and trying to force a side on on anybody or which camp is the most right or whatever the question is that i want to stick to is how 
do we see God's sovereignty? How do we see God's sovereignty? How do you prove that God is sovereign? Isaiah 46, I'm pulling a few things out of Isaiah tonight. 46, 8 through 10 says this, remember this and be assured, recall to mind your transgressions. Remember the former things long past for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. How do we see and prove God's sovereignty? It's in the first two parts of, of verse 8. Remember this. Remember this. In the second part, recall to mind the best way that you can truly see God's sovereignty is not looking forward. The best way that we truly understand and see the sovereignty of God is not looking forward, but it's looking backwards. And I say that not looking backwards like Lot's wife. Oh, look at that. I really miss boop. Hey, what's for dinner? Okay. But like it says here in Isaiah, remember this. That's looking backwards. That's remembering what God has done. If we look forward, we can trust that God is going to be sovereign. And we know from his promises that he will fulfill his promises. We, we know that all of the things will come to pass or his desires will come to pass. He will finish those things. But looking backwards is how we truly see the sovereignty of God. Ecclesiastes 11.5 Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of a pregnant woman. So you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. So looking forward, how are you going to do that, Lord? I, I don't know. I can't even understand, you know, how the two cells get together and split and do, and I don't get it, right? I mean, with modern day science, we kind of understand some things, but I say, no, we don't. No, we don't. It's, it is truly miraculous, truly miraculous. How, what we're talking about here, how babies are formed and grow and the cells multiply and totally, utterly God. So how do we think that we could even try to understand his sovereignty for the future? We have to know, we must know from remembering, from looking at the back. When we look at the future and we try to understand God's sovereignty, the only thing that we can truly understand is we don't understand. We don't know what the future holds or how God's sovereign plan will work out. And I say that with the exception of eschatological promises, okay? We know that certain events are going to take place in the future, but those are pieces of God's sovereign plan. How he in totality works out the future events we don't get it. You know, I mean, there's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But day by day in each other's life, in life here, we don't know tomorrow. We only know who holds tomorrow. 
okay? So when we look at the sovereignty, we can only look at promises. Oh, you Lord, you said you're going to do this. So I'm going to see how you do that. But understanding how he brings all that stuff to fruition, we don't. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. <laughs> okay, he's got plans. What does that mean to us? We don't know. We don't know. We have a hope. We have a future. Because God's got plans. He's got big plans. But we, we can't figure out how he works those plans together. We just know that he will, in the end, finish those things. That's his sovereignty. So with that understanding, really, we can't look forward. We can't look to the future to understand or prove his sovereignty. We always have to look back. I love the song that, that we just sang tonight, The Goodness of God. From the when I look back, from the moment I woke up to the when I went to bed, from this trial, this temptation, oh man, Lord, you are good, you are so good to me. But what am I doing? I'm kind of going. I'm reflecting on the things that are past, and I'm seeing God's hand in everything that has happened. There are so many of us that are that are here tonight that to try to understand God's sovereignty, we, each one of us can go, okay, wait a minute. And then when we look back through trials, through hardships, through bad things, we can't look forward and see God's hand in those things. We have to look back and bring those things to remembrance and go, oh, wow, Lord, you really did bring me through that. You, oh, look, you carried me through that one, right? That, that's how we see the, that's how we see the sovereignty of God. We remember. But I would be amiss if um, I didn't uh, eventually give you a, uh, where am I? We'll move on. Totally lost where I was going to say. Psalm 78, 5 through 7 says, For he establishes a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children, that they should put their confidence in a God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. So, proving God's sovereignty right there. Remember his hand leading you through that. And then take that remembrance, it says, and teach them to your children that God is sovereign and carried you through that. And then they will teach their children that God is sovereign and carried grandma and grandpa through this, right? We have to pass that down. So each one of us have to go, remember how God did, and then you guys fill in the blank. You guys fill in the blank. Oh, he did this and he brought me through that and he lifted me and encouraged me for this. That's how you will see and you will remember God's sovereignty. If we remember all the way back to the beginning, when we look at God's sovereignty, we have to look at his eternality to understand God's sovereignty, right? God always existed. God was always there. Everything that was created was created by him, but he was before that. So the plan was before the creation, 
and before the plan was God. So that is his the the beginning of his sovereignty because he goes, oh, look it. But he even knew the end when he was doing all of that. So his purpose was, okay, yeah, I know that. Well, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. John's going to be a real one to deal with on earth, but that's okay. I can deal with him because he knew the end. First Corinthians 8, 6 says, but there is but one God, the Father from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. We know that by looking back, by looking back to the beginning, by looking back to, oh, before the beginning, there was God before that. So, The next question is that one that I've been trying to bring into every time when we have these studies of um, systematic theology, because a lot of times we can, oh yeah, I understand that, and I can explain God's, you know, sovereignty. Well, it happened with, and we intellectually, yeah, we can get that. But the most important thing for us, really, to understand is. How does this apply to us? How does God's sovereignty apply to us? So knowing that God is in complete control, knowing that he works all things out, we will always, it's human nature, go, why am I going through this trial? Why am I having to deal deal with this disease? Or why is that child dying? It's just a, a little right? Lord, you have the power and ability to fix this, to just go, huh, fixed. The question people ask is, if God is a good God and he's always in control, then why is there sickness? Why is there oppression? Why is there hatred in the world? If God was really sovereign, He wouldn't allow these things to happen. Even with us as Christians, understanding, knowing, believing that God is sovereign, we look around the world and we see the chaos. We see the horrible things, right? We we see the sin. We see the disease. And we, in our finite mind compare the yuck um, and the filth that's out there to what we think a God in total control should do. That's what we do. Well, this is really bad and look what's happening to all these children. Well, yes, and I'm not trying to make light of some of those things whatsoever, but we put our thoughts this is what God should really do instead of just knowing that God is sovereign we ask the question Lord I I, I thought I thought you were in control sometimes it's not very comforting for us to know that there's all these bad things and God's not doing anything about it that's our human nature That's us going, I have a better way, Lord. Okay? That's not right. So, this is how God's sovereignty applies to us. Joshua 21, 45. Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed, all came to pass. God fulfills his promises. Where there's judgment needed, there will be judgment. Eventually, where there's healing needed, there will be healing. You you see what I'm saying? We could go on with list after list after list. All of the things that God promises to us to be our comfort, to be our helper, to be our... He will bring 
to fruition. All will come to pass. So that moment that we start thinking that he's not in control or, or he missed that time that I was going through that one trial or whatever it is, when we think that God doesn't have the power to heal the, the broken heart or to pull me out of the, the, the depression or heal the disease that I just came up with, in reality, when we question that, we are questioning his sovereignty because he will, for whatever purpose, work all of those things out. Too many times we as Christians, we think about the sovereignty of God in our situations, right? And we think about his all control, all ability, all understanding, knowledge. We send up our prayers and expect immediate results. Lord, I'm going through this. I, I'm going to give it to you. And then if it's not gone by the next day, dude, seriously? Right? We, we don't get those immediate results. We get upset or we get angry and we, we think that, you know, maybe God's not hearing my prayers or that God's not in control. And in reality, we're just doubting his sovereignty. We're just doubting that control that we're talking about. Vodi Bakum, and no, I can't do a Vodi impersonation, or a Ken Graves impersonation, or a Barry White impersonation, but Vodi says this, the natural tendency of suffering saints is to assume that God doesn't hear, and so we doubt his care for us. We fear the worst and sometimes we take it a step further and we shake our fist at God and, and we blame God. We're crying out to God. We're not experiencing immediate relief. We assume that God is not hearing us. And if God is not going to hear us, why bother? Why bother? So with that in mind, with that being kind of our human nature, <coughs> this is how... God's sovereignty applies to us. We can't allow ourselves, us, our mind, our thoughts, to twist our view of an all-controlling God, of a sovereign God that, that will work things out. We have to trust that, that we are in this process and this plan in a specific way at a specific time at a specific, you name it, and God is going to work things out. We must remind ourselves that He is in control, even though it looks bleak, even though it looks desperate, even when we don't see it or see the end result, we have to trust the Lord. David gave us some great advice in Psalm 27. He says, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. I love how David, David is just an an open book, obviously, because it's a open, we open to him and it's an open book. But he's totally transparent with the way that he was feeling at all times, right? If, if he was angry with his enemies, he was totally transparent. Lord, break their teeth, okay? It, David was a passionate man. And I love here how he says, I would have despaired, right? I would have just fallen apart the world would have ended everything would have crashed in but i believed in his promises that's the thing we can head down a direction or we can trust and believe in the promises of the lord if if you remember an example um in the in the old testament of joseph okay Jacob, his dad, Jacob had a kid. It, well, he actually had, what, 12 kids, okay? 
And Joseph was number 11, okay? His 10 other brothers got jealous of Joseph because Jacob loved him more than all the other ones. I mean, he's just, this is my favorite, okay? Which is uh, not a good thing to do, but that's a whole nother study, okay? So these jealous brothers, they, they plot to kill Joseph. Okay, you know what? I'm tired of him. This little squirt gets all dad's attention. Let's kill him. They're planning on killing him, but then the end result, they kind of come up with, you know, all right, all right, we're going to listen to the oldest brother. And instead of killing him, we're going to throw him in this pit with no water. And maybe we'll just let him die. I, I don't know. But then they decide to sell him to the Midianites or the, not the Midianites, the Ishmaelites, right? So they sell him to the Ishmaelites, these traveling people as a slave then the Ishmaelites sell him to the Egyptians. He probably gets passed around to the slave owners here and this. And okay, I'm going to buy slaves in bulk so that I can sell them individually and make more money. However, the slaves of Costco go back then. But he gets horse traded around a bit. And then he ends up right in Potiphar's house. And then pretty soon he ends up in Pharaoh's house. You all know what happened. Long story short, after all, all of the horrible seriously my brothers are gonna kill me then they sold me as a slave and then i went to jail and i was in prison and i i don't have my nice hair anymore because i have to look like an egyptian and whatever it was all of the horrible things that happened to joseph at the very end he had one thing to say genesis 50 verse 20 as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. To preserve many people alive. He went through all that. Just like we go through all things like that sometimes. May not be sold as a slave, but we have troubles we have trials that we go through we could go through so many accounts in the old testament daniel right with the lions we could go through job or noah or whoever take your pick and in the midst of their trial they're probably not going oh thank you lord for all of these lions that are going to eat me they're probably going lord <laughs> lord what are we going to do? What are you going to do? But just like Joseph, what the world intends for not good, for evil, God has a purpose for. Even in our trials, even in our tribulation, God has a purpose. When we get to that purpose, the only way, again, that we see that sovereignty is when we look back at that trial and see, oh, Lord, you made me go to prison, get sold as a slave, get accused of, of raping this lady, get whatever. But now I'm in a position to do this. Oh, Lord, that's, that's God's sovereignty. That's his perfect plan, right? That happens to us if we just pay attention. If we just look back. Psalm 105.5 says, as we wrap up here, remember his wonders, which he has done. His marvels and the judgments uttered by his mouth. Remember. That's application for us. And that's how we prove God's sovereignty. Remembering the consistent, absolute, glorious, wondrous things that he has done. We have to continue to remind ourselves of God's sovereignty. Continually remind ourselves that he is in control, even in hard trials. Even in when we look at the world and we see the sin, the Lord really is in control control 
He really is continuing to work out his plan until it's finished. Remind yourself of that. Lord, we thank you for being sovereign. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you that even in our limited short life, God, we can look back and in our life over and over and over, we can see your sovereign hand leading us through. God, we can't wait till you finish and you bring all of these things to a conclusion and we get to spend eternity with you. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.